and let's form our sentence. Remember, when you get to this sentence, it's always who's doing the action, what are they doing? So we go back, on a hot summer day out in the ocean, two sweaty kids jumped into the cool, refresh refreshing ocean. Off in the distance, they spotted a shark's fin pop out of the water. Who's doing the action? The two kids. The kids, yeah, I could say kids again because I said kids at the beginning, then I had a sentence here, so I could go back and say kids again. The kids, action, what do the kids do? The kids started waving their arms in the air for help. We could draw a line and we could start the sentence with just the. The kids started waving their arms in the air for help. Or maybe we could do a, a sound effect. So we could have the word the there. We could have suddenly the kids started waving their arms in the air. Quickly they started waving their arms in the air. What if we add an emotion? How do they feel right now? They feel terrified. They feel horrified. They feel frightened. They feel terrified, horrified, panicky. So what could I do over here at the beginning of my sentence? I could start with emotion words. I could write terrified and frightened. The kids started waving their hands in the air for help. Ooh, let's do that. Terrified and frightened. The kids started waving their hands in the air for help. Now we have our sentence. What do we do? Let's go back and repeat the steps. Ready? What happened next after the kids started waving their hands in the air? So now we draw our action box. And what happens? We have the kids talk to each other about an idea. Someone says the lifeguard came in and saved them. So here's the lifeguard. He's going to come out there and pull the kids back in. So let's say we have his arm here. He's pulling them back in. And again, remember, stick figures. Does this have to be anything that's an art project? No. Look at this. I'm just showing the lifeguard, and what is he doing? He's rescuing the kids. He's pulling them in from the water. All right. Now that we have our idea there, we're going to go back, and we're going to repeat our whole organizer so that we can help. That will help us form our new sentence. On a hot summer day, down at the beach, two sweaty kids jumped into the cool, refreshing water. Off in the distance, they spotted a shark's fin pop out of the ocean. Terrified and frightened, they started waving their hands in the air for help. Who's doing the action here? A lifeguard. What did the lifeguard do? He swam out to the kids and pulled them in to the shore. Okay. So, he swam out to the kids. Did he just swim or did he race out? He raced out to the kids and pulled them into the shore. There we go. There's a more powerful part of speech. So, action. So, who's doing our action? The lifeguard. Action. What did he do? He raced out to the kids and pulled them in. So, we could just start that with the word the instead of a transition. So now we have a lifeguard swam out to the kids and pulled them in. A lifeguard raced out to the kids and pulled them in to the shore. So now what do we start that with? Just the word A. A lifeguard raced out to the kids and pulled them into the shore. That's basically the end of our story. So we have our story opening, actions, actions, actions. Now what part do we have? The story is done. Now we have a story is done, now we have to ask. After all of this happened, after the kids were saved, they're going to look back. So the kids look back on this experience, what happened to them. What are they thinking? What do they say? Or what are they feeling? So you want to find out. You want to end the story so that kids don't just say, the end, I hope you like my story. You want to give them a way to come up with a better closing. So you want the kids to reflect on what did these two characters think? say or feel at the end of the story after this happened to them. They could have looked up at the lifeguard and said, thank you so much, you saved our life. They may feel lucky that someone so brave came to save them. They may think to themselves that they'll never swim somewhere unless there's a lifeguard around. We go back and maybe they look up to, at the lifeguard with their big eyes. And say thank you for saving my life and here's the lifeguard 
Here we go. Let's end the story. So how about we say, in the end, or ooh. How about start with the word after? After they were back on the beach, after they felt safe. Ooh, let's do that. After they felt safe. Go back and read the whole thing. On a hot summer day, down at the beach, two sweaty kids jumped into the cool, refreshing water. Off in the distance, they spotted a shark's fin pop out of the water. Terrified and frightened, they started waving, the kids started waving their hands in the air for help. A lifeguard jumped into the water. No, a lifeguard raced to the kids and pulled them to the shore. After that, the two kids looked up the little lifeguard and thanked him for being so brave. So we have all of our ideas here. Now what are we gonna go do? Let's go back, let's add our capitals and our punctuation. So now we're going to have our red pen, or they'll have a red crayon. We put our pen in the air, or crayons in there, we go punctuation time! We have our capital and period here. Now let's go over to our second sentence that starts off with off. What are we gonna do? Just color in the O red. Off in the distance, so I know after the end of that transition I need what? A comma. The two kids spotted a shark pop his fin out of the water. So now we're gonna put our period there. Terrified and frightened, what do I put after that? A comma. They started waving their arms in the air for help, period. A lifeguard raced to the kids and pulled them to the shore period. After that, the two kids looked up at the lifeguard and thanked him for being brave, period. So now we have our punctuation. Do we need to add fancy words? Let's go back to our sentences and decide. Let's look at our second sentence. What in the second sentence is the most important thing for the reader to see? Probably that fin. So what kind of fin, so remember I'm asking what kind of, and then I'm putting in the context of the sentence, what kind of fin would the two kids spot that would terrify them? Let's see, am I using emotion words for a fin? Probably not, five senses, yeah. Maybe it's a tall pointy fin. I'm gonna say what it looks like. So tall or pointy. Ooh, maybe I'll put pointy only on my idea. And now we have terrified and frightened the two kids. Well, we already described how they felt. So I'll just say, I'll just leave that. We don't need fancy words for that sentence. A what, in this sentence, a lifeguard swam out to the kids or raced out to the kids and pulled them into the shore. What's the most important thing to describe here? I would say the lifeguard. So are we gonna say what the lifeguard looks like, his emotion or his personality? I think his personality, is he a scaredy cat or is he brave? Let's say brave. So we write brave here. And then after a while, after that, the two kids looked up at their, the lifeguard and thanked him. All right, for being so brave, uh-oh, how about we say courageous? We don't want to have the same words over and over again, right? We look at our writing, we have our fancy words, we have our periods, our capitals, we have sophisticated sentences. The students now have their organizers complete. They're going to orally rehearse it over and over and over again. You can do this together as a whole class. Then you can say, turn to your buddy, read it to your buddy, and both pairs read it together. Some kids take turns reading it. I leave that up to the kids. I like to get them to read it together because that gives them more oral language practice. Some kids just need to take turns. I don't worry about it. They're all rehearsing the story. I'm walking around and listening. Do they have a handle on this story? Have they rehearsed it enough so that they're fluent in it? And do I, am I looking for memorization? No, as a matter of fact, if the kids try to memorize, they won't be able to read it because they're trying to think of words that we said instead of just looking at the pictures. So always have them go back and say, look at the pictures. Who's doing the action? What are they doing? Let's just say the sentence like that. So they go back, they rehearse it, and as you hear kids who have control over it, you tell them to start writing, start writing. They have lined paper with their yellow box on the first line to remind them to indent. And with their lined paper, they put it right next to their organizer. And what are they going to do? Rehearse their organizer over and over and over again. They rehearse it, so they'll go to the first sentence and they'll say it. Then they go to write it down and they say that first sentence. As they're writing it, they're saying it. Go back, reread the first sentence, and form the second sentence. 
as they say the second sentence and they say it pretty well and they're satisfied with it, then they go over and they write it out. And as they're writing, they're saying it again. Now you go back to the top, rehearse the first two, and now practice the third one. Once they have the third one in place, then they go to write it on their organ. What do they do there? They constantly reread the words too. When they're finished, one of the ways for them to check for their punctuation is to count the periods. On this particular paper that we came up with, we had one, two, three, four, five. They can go back to their paper and count. Do I have five periods? Then they are going to go back and count their capitals. And what they do is they go to the first word, make sure it's capitalized, and then they go to every stop sign, every period, and look right after it, and there should be a capital. So they count the capitals at the beginning, and then they count the capitals right after the periods, and there should be five in this case. We look, that's a way to help them check for their punctuation on their own. If they don't have that, then what they need to do is go back and do what I call touch points. And that's where they touch the word on. It would be over here where on is, and their finger would be touching on, and their finger would be touching that period. So they're touching both, and they're reading their sentence. Then they go to their writing paper and touch the word on, read the sentence, and put a finger where the period should be there. If it matches, then they go to the next part of their organizer. They touch the O and the period here, they read it, and then they go to their writing paper and make sure that it matches. That way they can find out where they left out any capitalization or periods by rereading their paper. This is your stage three narrative writing. We went through the steps. See if you can walk through the steps again, grab a blank piece of paper, and see if you can use the steps to make your own story. One other point I need to make is this. You're never writing in front of the kids. You're planning the organizer and you're drawing an organizer in these whole group lessons. So you and the children together are, write, are drawing out an organizer. But when it comes to the writing part, you're not writing. And the reason why is they will copy. You are only saying rehearse your organizer, now go ahead and write it out. And when you say go write it out, sometimes kids freeze. They just go like this. So I always go like this. Ooh, look how people are writing. People are writing already. They're saying the words and writing them down. They've seen you do this before because you've planned your writing using the steps in the teacher write. And together in interactive writing, the students and you have planned stories, and then different children have come up and written the sentences during interactive writing. So it's not like they haven't seen what it looks like to rehearse and write, rehearse and write. But you, during these whole group lessons, when they're actually making their own organizer, you do not write it out. You have them write it out. They can write sentences. This is why they're at stage three. They can write it. They can write the words down. Now they're really focusing on organizing a story and making sure it's sophisticated, on topic, with sentences that are cohesive and coherent. Let me caution you. Don't write a story ahead of time and then come back here and use these steps. I didn't do that even for this demonstration. I did not come up with this story ahead of time. I just used the steps. The steps are what will form a story. If you try to write a story ahead of time, then basically when you go to the steps and you say, who's in our story, a person or an animal, or I am, and the kids go, two kids, and you, and you had a story about a bunny, and you're like, well, no, no, well, let's write about a bunny. They're not learning how to use the steps to make a story. They're just trying to guess your story. The whole process that I've created here are the metacognitive steps students need to learn in order to plan their own stories so that they have sophisticated sentences that are cohesive and coherent and interesting and stay on topic. We don't want to plan something ahead of time and have them guess our story. We want to use these steps for them to learn so they can eventually make their own stories. That's the whole point here is learning these steps. Good luck. Go grab another piece of paper, see if you can use the steps again, but this time to make your own story. Good luck and I hope you enjoy it.